So we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. And uh, I just wanted to wish everyone a good afternoon and a welcome to uh, NCAI's uh, fourth and final uh, webinar as part of its uh, Why Native Small Businesses Matter and How to Grow Them webinar series. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Ian Record. I serve as a governance policy and strategy consultant for Native nations and organizations, uh, specializing in economic development, workforce development, constitutional reform, federal Indian policy, and related areas. Uh, I previously served as uh, Vice President of Tribal Governance and Special Projects with uh, NCAI. It is my honor to serve as moderator for this final webinar in our four-part series, uh, which launches the Why Native Small Businesses Matter and How to Grow Them animated video series. Uh, this series of three short videos is designed to educate current and future tribal leaders, key decision makers, citizens, other Indian country stakeholders, and non-Native policymakers about the vital importance of Native-owned small businesses to the rebuilding of vibrant Native economies and how tribal governments can best support the cultivation of a vibrant small business ecosystem in and around tribal lands. In our webinar today, we will focus on the importance of tribal governance developing a robust constellation of partnerships with various non-governmental entities such as Native Community Development Financial Institutions, Tribal Colleges and Universities, Native Business Alliances and Chambers of Commerce, other non-Native uh, other Native nonprofit organizations and non-Native entities, so that they can together create a comprehensive system of supports for existing and, and aspiring uh, Native entrepreneurs. To delve into this topic today, we are honored to have with us today, uh, Leslie Cabote and Lakota Vogel. An enrolled member of the Crow Tribe of Montana, Leslie Cabote is president of Indigenous Collaboration, Inc., a company offering consensus-based processes for effective collaboration with tribal governments, enterprises, Native communities, and nonprofits. She also serves her nation as commissioner of the Upsalika Nation Housing Authority and is founder of a community development nonprofit in her tribal district. Lakota Vogel, an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, serves as executive director of Four Bands Community Fund in South Dakota, a treasury certified Native Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFI. Four Bands programs and services translate the traditional Lakota values of self-sufficiency, wise resource management, and a spirit of entrepreneurship into practical applications for today's modern economy. Lakota also serves on USDA's Equity Commission and sits on the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis's Board of Directors. So uh, we are going to get to our panel here in a few minutes, but before we do, we we would like to share with you uh, the three videos that are part of this animated video series. And uh, this has been uh, this has been an idea in, in NCI's mind for several years. Uh, in fact, uh, before COVID, it had secured a grant to support its development of these videos, and. Um, COVID and a number of other factors um, um, caused some delays in its production, but um, we were uh, we were excited to get this project off the ground this year or, or last year in 2023 and complete it with the help of uh, Lakota, Leslie, and about 10 other uh, content contributors who uh, informed and provided feedback on these videos at various stages of their development and were instrumental in making sure that the content was appropriate and, and on point, the messaging was uh, on point, and that the tone of what we were sharing was um, was culturally appropriate and in sync with um, what any country has been telling us for decades, has been showing us for decades, which is that um, this return to entrepreneurship is a vital uh, component of rebuilding thriving tribal economies. And so... Uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to Suzanne to play the three videos. We're going to play them in succession, and then we're going to turn to our panel. So, Suzanne? What is a Native economy? It's the constellation of self-governed economic activities a Native people choose to do together in accordance with their cultural, social, ecological, and political values and institutions. The goal of a Native economy is to nourish and sustain that people's distinct sense of identity, belonging, place, balance, 
and relationships with one another and the natural world, enabling them to flourish on their own terms. Since time immemorial, Native peoples have flourished through their sacred design and maintenance of sophisticated, adaptive economies, often in the face of harsh conditions and changing circumstances. At the heart of a Native economic life were robust local and intertribal systems of commerce. Everyone in the community contributed to these systems, male and female, young and old, leaders and followers. Rigorous training practices equipped individuals and groups with specialized knowledge and skills to make those contributions. These training practices also instilled the value of reciprocity, the profound obligation to play their designated roles, and a deep understanding of how community members' well-being relied on the contributions of others. They were basket weavers, food harvesters, canoe carvers, fishers, tool makers, large and small game hunters, hide tanners, corn growers, and the list goes on and on. Called social entrepreneurs today, they were resourceful and tireless. The community counted on them to sustainably produce and provide vital goods and services that promoted the common good, not just for today, but for generations to come. Traditionally, Native peoples also embraced a deep abiding commitment to recirculate these economic resources as many times as possible. They did this within the community through gifting and exchange and beyond through wide ranging trade networks with other Native peoples. They understood from long experience that by prioritizing this interdependence, or as some people call it, the multiplier effect, they would maximize long-lasting benefits of their economic contributions so all community members could flourish. So that's the first video, which, as you could see, focuses on traditional Native economies, and the second one will focus on uh, the impact of colonial policies on those traditional economies. So, Suzanne? Colonialism turned Native economies upside down. It decimated Native governance institutions and trade networks and severed Native peoples from the places they depended on for their sustenance. Instead of prioritizing regenerative activities that cultivated, circulated, and grew local economic resources within and between Native communities, Colonial policies and institutions extracted economic resources from Native communities for the benefit of dominant society. They did this until those resources were diminished or destroyed. A Native community's livelihood once depended on everyone in the community doing their part. But now, economic development involved only the few tribal leaders and citizens who were needed to secure the removal of resources from Native lands for the benefit of non-Natives. The economic health of Native communities was no longer determined by Native agency and production, but rather by outside market forces and the ulterior motives of states, Congress, the administration, and the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, Native social entrepreneurs, once the wellspring of Native prosperity, were actively excluded from this new economic equation. The devastating effects of this systematic suppression of Native economies endure today, including tribal economic strategies that focus only on launching large businesses that the tribal nation can own and operate, increasing federal funding to support community members and attracting outside investors to the community. Limited opportunities for community members to play the valued economic roles they once did, which has made some people dependent on the government for their welfare and prompted others to take their talents elsewhere, a dynamic known as brain drain. Widespread disregard for Native entrepreneurs as an economic force, leaving them little access to the infrastructure, resources, and technical assistance 
needed to start and grow businesses in native communities and driving those who do largely underground. Weak local systems of commerce with few places for community members to get what they need, forcing them to venture outside of the community to do so. Severe economic leakage where the financial resources a native community has immediately leaves it before it can recirculate, greatly weakening their power to bring lasting benefits to the entire community. Limited community understanding of and appreciation for the core cultural value of doing business with one's fellow community members and native communities that are economically isolated from one another with little, if any, trade between them. Overall, the systematic suppression of native economies has left native communities with limited ability to foster self-determined economic growth and long-term community prosperity. And finally, video three, which talks about the growing movement across Indian country to recenter entrepreneurship in tribal economy building, uh, the positive impacts that is generating and some effective strategies. Over the past several decades, a self-determination renaissance has swept across Indian country. Tribal nations are uprooting the oppressive colonial policies and institutions that have greatly harmed their communities by once again seizing the reins of self-governance. In the process, they are rebuilding native economies that enact their cultural values and long-range visions for a vibrant future. For a growing number, this means reconnecting with their age-old entrepreneurial spirit by making the cultivation of local small businesses owned by tribal citizens a central foundation of their efforts to revitalize tribal systems of commerce and foster sustainable economic growth on their own terms. These nations are forging blueprints for success, featuring effective strategies that are proving useful for other tribal nations. These include implementing a trauma-informed plan to help tribal citizens heal and become prepared to play the roles that revitalizing the tribal nation's economy require codifying a comprehensive small business development initiative in the nation's economy rebuilding approach and dedicating the financial and human resources it needs to take root and grow. Defining the distinct type of businesses the nation and its citizens should own and how the citizen-owned businesses can help meet the community's needs. Assessing the current state of the nation's economy, including the severity of economic leakage from the community, how to stem that leakage by working with native entrepreneurs, and the nation's capacity to build a thriving citizen-owned business ecosystem. Creating a robust system of tribal laws to foster citizen-owned business development and growth like a uniform tribal commercial code. Consistently enforcing those laws through an independent and properly resourced judicial mechanism that fairly resolves commercial disputes. Building a culture of accountability to those laws through ongoing tribal leader and staff trainings and community education. Helping citizens launch and grow small businesses through streamlined business licensing, site leasing, and related regulations. Education, training, and technical assistance, financial assistance, and building the physical and digital infrastructure they need. Providing native entrepreneurs with integrated support like startup and growth capital, training, business plan development, and market feasibility studies through partnerships with native nonprofits, CDFIs, co ops, tribal colleges and universities, chambers of commerce, small business development centers, and others. Developing an economic profile that documents the skills and interests of the tribal workforce, the citizen owned small businesses in the community tribal and regional market forecasting and how the citizen-owned business community can evolve to meet future market needs. Creating a procurement policy requiring that tribal government and tribal enterprises do business with certified citizen-owned businesses first and other native-owned businesses second, and helping those businesses become certified. 
launching a permanent Buy Native campaign so that everyone understands the financial, social, and cultural benefits citizen-owned businesses provide. Promoting local, citizen-owned businesses to other Native communities, the surrounding region, and the world. Modestly taxing citizen-owned businesses and reinvesting that revenue in their growth through loans, marketing, training, and technical assistance. Holding the federal government accountable to its trust and treaty obligations to fund Native small businesses and engaging state governments and philanthropic partners to do the same. Learning from the innovations of other tribal nations to strengthen the nation's development of a healthy ecosystem for citizen-owned businesses. And celebrating successful citizen-owned businesses within the community and beyond. When tribal nations embrace these strategies, they nurture a vibrant economy producing a multitude of benefits, including more local jobs, keeping more dollars circulating within the community and keeping talented, hardworking tribal citizens at home, a reduced cost of living and an improved quality of community life, the emergence of new role models for Native youth, and ultimately, a strong and resilient foundation upon which to flourish as Native people once again. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, you saw there in the credits, we were we had the great fortune of uh, having Alice uh, Connick Glenn and Inupiaq from Alaska uh, lend her voice to this video, these videos, and she's very very talented young lady. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I do want to turn to the panel, and we're going to uh, ask Lakota to share first. Uh, I would ask that attendees, if you have any questions for either of the panelists, um, we're going to hold those questions until after they they both uh, share. Uh, but if you can put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom, you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a Q&A uh, function. You click on that and you can add your questions. And we'll get to, to as many as we can in the uh, time we have with you this afternoon. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lakota to kick us off. Well, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, NCAI, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Lakota Vogel. I am the executive director at Four Bands Community Fund. Uh, we're based here in Eagle Butte, South Dakota. It's um, on the Shrine River Sioux Reservation in North Central South Dakota. And I'm just grateful for this video I, and this video compilation, I guess, honestly. I Back when I first started back in 2011 at um, Four Bands, I had wanted to do something, you know, on YouTube because that's where all the kids are, right? And uh, <laughs> the the draft that we came up with was literally moving like little bit you know pieces of paper and puppets along so this is a lot better than what i came up with back in 2011 so thank you for that um so a lot of the work that i do is one of those sort of solutions um that was mentioned in the last video and so the title of my presentation is growing native economies so you can go forward suzanne um Every time I speak about our community and the work that we do, I like to share a picture of the Shrine River Sioux Reservation and just show the inset. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the state of South Dakota and how large geographically the size of the Shrine River Sioux Reservation is, which oftentimes comes with its own issues, but sometimes it's hard for outsiders to grasp that. Like, you know, the Shrine River Sioux Reservation is really, really large and it's it's between the sizes of like Connecticut and Rhode Island oftentimes when I advocate for it and understanding like the water systems, um, you know, the, the policing systems, all of the infrastructure needed to live here is usually operated by one entity and it's a lot of distance to cover. You know, your ambulances, they all have to travel this distance, including workforce, right? We all drive throughout all of these. So one of the main things we talk about a little bit is the economic centers, um, which are small and compared comparison to a lot of the large areas. So we're rural and remote. 75% um, of the folks living within this space are Native American. 
uh, the population is growing, but it's sort of straining the, the existing infrastructure and systems. So we, um, you know, we've got all of the things that come along with living within this society that was stripped with, you know, from assets and things like that from colonization. So we've got a high unemployment rate. We did a household survey back in 2016 in partnership with um, Shine Rasu Tribal Ventures, and we have a 47% unemployment rate within this space, but we have a very young population. We have about 45% of the population under the age of 18, which has informed a lot of the work that's done, um, informed us to have like a youth strategy and to focus a lot of our, our work in the youth space and making sure that the youth are exposed to some of these concepts. Um, you can go forward, Suzanne. What we do at Four Bands, um, this is something that we call the theory of change. And it's sort of, it, it reminded me a lot of what was in the video of what we work on. So the first thing that we believe in is that when any tribal member wants to come into our building and talk about things around finance, um, we, we want to make sure that we're educating them first. Like that's the first step, no matter what the question is, if it's starting a small business, wanting to get a mortgage, wanting to learn about their credit, we want to start in that educate space. So we've built out programming to educate. Um, we provide the tools to increase the capacity for all of our members and clients to build wealth through a lot of different skill building services. Um, then if, if things are moving along and you're ready and the client is ready, we finance. So we approach our financing strategy as a method of healing instead of hurting. Um, we've got a large investment portfolio um, outstanding right now. We've got over 21 million pushing out into native communities across the state of South Dakota. Um, and it's been a blend of financial investment and equity programs to address like systemic barriers. Um, so we do offer a few things like equity grants to help our small businesses overcome some of those challenges of not having collateral due to colonization and asset stripping and uh, different forms of equity. So it builds their balance sheet and it establishes um, them as a small business in their community and possibly they can get capital at, at a regular bank at some point. Then if everything goes well with financing, whether it be for your home renovation, like I said, we do everything, not just small business lending. Um, we want to make sure that we're incubating our clients and that we're really focusing and spending time with them. So you can't just hand people money and expect things to go well. And that's everywhere in America, not just in Indian country. Um, so we want to acknowledge the historical trauma as the video brought up and just increase that intergenerational capacity of individuals within the household to build and sustain wealth or build and sustain their small business and, and continuously provide them with services like accounting services if they need to set up their payroll at a small business or making sure that they get marketing and they can get their you know product out there. So that's what we do in that incubation phase. And then we actually also built a physical incubator where people can lease space from us in the res on the reservation in Eagle Butte to test out an idea without going all in and getting a big loan. And then uh, the, the community and the market just not picking up on their idea and the business failing. And then they're stuck with a, a ton of debt. So we, we also have an incubator. And then the last part, sorry, is just to um, advocate. So as a CDFI, like it's really important for us to make sure that we're protecting the collective knowledge gained by our communities throughout the time that the video showed, but and also to mitigate harm produced by any of these wealth stripping mechanisms and to make sure that you advocate for policies and standards that create long-term economic sustainability for your community, for the tribe, and for the individuals. So the next slides are just fun slides to talk about the growth and the opportunity within our markets. So thank you, Suzanne. Is just talking about the opportunity we have in Indian country. And this is just an, on Cheyenne River in the state of South Dakota. Imagine if we did this for the entire nation. There's a lot of potential. So since 2002, we've placed $45 million in under-resourced communities. Um, it's, it's a huge achievement. It's a great accomplishment. And you can just see the exponential growth these later years. And it's like, especially after COVID, I, I feel like a lot of natives that were running small businesses um, Either we're in a leasing position and really decided that this is the, the opportunity for them to own. And so they're shifting into ownership or and or they just didn't want to continue to work for their employer for various reasons and now have these great ideas and are starting small businesses across, at least in my my target market, which is South Dakota. Um, next slide. We like to share a lot with like tribal leadership, um, share with state legislators that there really is an optimism in native markets. Uh, this is just of that subset. This is just our small business loans, because I mentioned we do agriculture loans and mortgages. So 
you can still see the growth of the ideas here. And, you know, $6 million in small business loans in 2023. I, it's just, it's exciting. Um, and I can share more about those small businesses and types here in a minute. But if anybody's interested, uh, these are this is the growth that we've been seeing. You know, a lot of Native Americans are able to borrow larger amounts. Um, our average business loan size was sitting at 43000 And we're seeing them, you know, purchase larger assets. Like I said, moving from leasing positions to ownership within the community. So the loan sizes are growing, which is exciting. Of our portfolio, 93% are Native American borrowers. Um, we do kind of monitor like what's happening across the state, but ensuring that a lot of our capital stays on Shrine River. So, but 24% of that is off reservation. Um, and then just showing like the strength of our borrowing borrowing base. Um, Native Americans pay back their money, uh, you know, despite what we might hear and all of the negative things said about us. But we have less than 1% um, past due or delinquent, which is really, really exciting. Um, it really goes back to be having relationships within your community and how you're working. And then um, the average interest rate, just so everybody knows, you know, we don't have to follow prime and, and skyrocket up when prime goes up like it is now. Uh, we can actually maintain a CDFI's a healthy rate because we fundraise. So I just wanted to share because we're very transparent about what our interest rates are. So our average interest rate is about 5.2%. Um, Suzanne, you want to move to the next one? And one thing we also track and we want to be careful about as a lender we take money and we're moving it into places you can move forward suzanne um is ensuring that how we're lending is not like banks and it's not limiting access to capital so we really did a look back and wanted to judge what was mitigating risk in our portfolio are the things that we always hear about you know when you how much collateral do you have how much equity do you have what's your debt to income ratio all those things you might hear when you go to a bank were they really important enough to predict risk in our portfolio? So we did a look back and we looked over a hundred of our loans and we found out the things that actually predict risk in our market are things like credit score, character score, and commitment to business. And these are things that our loan officers who are from the community, boots on the ground, are judging and saying, these are the things that we know to be true about you. And it doesn't matter what your collateral is and it doesn't matter what your equity is those things actually didn't predict risk. So it's just an interesting perception and a reframing of the way that our markets utilize capital. Um, and I can share more about that later. Do you wanna go to the last one? And oftentimes we get questions about, well, where where are people starting businesses? You know, like what are the sectors, what are they doing? And honestly, it's, it's not one or the other. You can see for my portfolio, we've got a large agricultural economy because we're very rural. So that's about 21% of our portfolio. And then we've got people wanting to buy houses, right? In order to build businesses, you also need a workforce and they need homes to live in. So we do have a large percent of our percentage of our portfolio and mortgages. But other than that, it's the various types of um, sectors that our small businesses are in. So yeah, it's exciting. There's really, every day is a new day, honestly, when we walk in and hear the new ideas from our clients. And and I just wanted to kind of, I, I appreciate the way the NCI, if you go to the last slide, like wrapped up the video to talk about the impacts of what this looks like and can look like in your community. So Four Bands has been very careful about ensuring we can define what success looks like for us. And we always revamp these, but it is these things that were mentioned at the end of the, the video, like ensuring that there's livable wage jobs, like that's what small businesses do. We want to make sure that the small businesses themselves have an increase in revenue profits and that the household income for that owner is actually going up and it's not hurting them. Uh, we want to make sure that people are spending locally, right? Get rid of that leakage and make sure that some of the money that we all make can stay here on the reservation. We can buy products locally and it can turn over. Um, and then we want to make sure that individuals feel confident so that their financial capability is engaged. And what we've noticed with that, honestly, is something we refer to as civic engagement. As people get involved with small businesses, they're more civically engaged in their society and their tribal government. And we've actually had some of our small business owners after they started a business here are like, I don't like, you know, how this is running. I need to change this. And they get more empowered to want to change systems and they run for tribal council. And it's really helpful for them to carry that knowledge about what it's like to run a business on the reservation. And then they carry that onto the council floor and try to make the systems better for the future um, of entrepreneurship here. So I, the last slide is just my contact information and I, you know, welcome anybody to reach out, but I, I want to, 
if I have any time left, I'm sorry if I went over, but I'll cede the rest of my time to Leslie and thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Lakota. I know you were not over time. Uh, before we turn to Leslie, I did I just want to um, you know, one of the one of the strategies that was featured in, in video three was that partnerships uh strategy, right? The fact that um tribal governments uh can't and shouldn't go go it alone when it comes to building tribal economies and as part of that supporting native entrepreneurs and there's there's existing players on many reservations and many tribal lands across the country that are integral to creating that ecosystem for for entrepreneurs to thrive um can you talk about that dynamic of um working hand in glove with tribal government how do you get to that place and 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 the the education you have to do to get tribal leaders to remember oh yeah there are these cdfis out there and they they do vital things in support of of native small business owners and we need to work directly with them and figure out how we can support their growth yeah, I think I, I apologize for leaving that out. I mean, Forbans was founded because a group of tribal leaders sat around and said, we need access to capital, especially for the artist community. So they put it in their comprehensive economic development plan back in 1999. And it was set as a revolving loan fund. Our community needs something called the revolving loan fund. And so we went around and um, had great leadership and founders that found the CDFI, you know, little logo and said, let's go after it. And so what we do, we, we tribal council, we've had council members sit on our board. Um, the only thing we don't allow, we've separated from the tribe. So we are a separate nonprofit, which helps because they can utilize us in another way. And council can sit on my board of directors and help us guide and direct us in, in the direction that's needed. But we don't allow them to sit on the loan committee and make active decisions about loans just so they're not influenced in, in any way. Um, but really, we all... Every administration is a new set of council, and we just we play a role of talking about how to develop the community. We've got open spaces, ensuring that um, some of the tribal property has the you know right infrastructure to develop out. They they hear about the small businesses that are wanting to start, and we sort of play that advocacy role in connecting the two in the mid in the middle. And then when you have a CDFI, also you can act as a financier kind of, and and look at different federal projects that are out there and and partner with the tribe. You know, so we've got SSBCI coming down the pike in most of our communities that access that, and we're looking forward to partnering with the tribe on funding the same small business together. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, and it's it's a really good idea to stay in partnership with tribal leadership and always keep them. Um, I don't know, in tune with what you're doing and then also lean into their ideas because they're they're hearing the the social side of of the work that we do. And we want to make sure that we're in an align in an alignment with that. So yeah, and I think part part of it, and you know, the video points it out is the, the need for tribal uh leaders to be messengers, um, both yeah. rhetorically in terms of, you know, just giving voice to the, the importance of uh stemming that leakage and providing local outlets for uh mm -hmm. purchase of goods and services by tribal citizens. Um, and then obviously practically through policy as well. Um, yeah. And then, and then you mentioned SSBCI state small business credit initiative, um, federal program. That's, that's going to be, um, on the, on the verge, or if, if folks haven't gotten already, uh, any day now getting, you know, um, collectively, I think in excess of several hundred million dollars coming out to Indian country, mm -hmm. um, to support, um, uh, the, the financing needs of, native entrepreneurs um this is kind of a, a monumental opportunity that um that you know it, it's it's critical that tribal governments if they're not directly involved with ssbci that they're at least connecting their entrepreneurs to those opportunities that are going to be available to yeah. them yes very so, true. so thank you lakota uh leslie let's turn over to you i know i know you're never short short on words so uh Please share. I know I saw I saw your head nodding a lot. So I know I know you're excited to talk about this topic and I've heard you speak of it before. So glad you're here with us today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was doing a lot of head nodding, doing a lot of uh, I, I was relating to um, and uh, clapping for in my heart the uh, the advancements um, that you've made. I think um, when I talk about um, tribal economies, I always like to uh, begin at the beginning because I think a lot of times our tribal nations and communities have a lot of ideas, but they don't really necessarily understand um, the structures of the systems we're operating in and how our tribal economies are related to the economy we're in um, in the United States. And I think that that's really a fundamental 
um, the, a fundamental understanding. Um, and and anybody who's ever been in our sessions, you know, we like to draw pictures because you can you can you can understand a lot of things if you can just see it. Um, and so I don't know if you have um, the triangle diagram um, that I that I. I often talk about, Ian knows I'm not short on words about that either. I hope that it can come up. It was just a, a drawn diagram in your email. Let me, uh, give me a, give me a moment and I will, uh, I will create, create that. Um, what, what Leslie's referring to is several years ago when I worked at the um, Native Nations Institute uh, for Leadership Management and Policy at the University of, University of Arizona, uh, which works with tribes on governance and development Um you know, uh, we, we had Leslie come in and speak to a group of um, up and coming tribal leaders. And uh, she did this great diagram that that really talks about how the pillars, the three main pillars you need within a tribal economy to have that local system of tribal commerce revived and, and vibrant um, doesn't exist in most communities. And it really, in large part, depends on, as you mentioned, um, the presence of small businesses, the presence of uh, the, these native nonprofit organizations and, you know, and, and CDFIs who were technically for, you know, for profit, but, um, they, they serve essentially a nonprofit role of, of providing these local places for people to grow economy and participate in economy. So, uh, while mm -hmm. you continue to talk, I'll, I'll create that and, uh, and bring it up on the screen. Um, yeah, if you look in the email, I think I sent you a, uh, Oh, perfect. A, okay. An image of one that we've used, but anyway, the, um, the main thing, the main takeaway is that we have a lot of, as as Lakota mentioned, we have a lot of people, um, talented, passionate people in the community who are, um, you know, who when you go into the process of acting on your passion and enthusiasm, you come up against the mountain of things that, one, you didn't even know. You're thinking about, you know, all of the fantastic, cool things you can make and get out there that people want. And you know that there's a market for it and you have an idea of how you can do it and who can help you and all of those things. And then you're looking for, um, you know, as Lakota mentioned, a storefront in one of the business centers. Um, and then you find out that, well, that storefront needs you know $150,000 worth of rehab before the water will work before blah 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 and to think of that's also our primary business centers on our reservation communities are derived from where our federal you know overseers or whatever back in the day we're occupying the space and that infrastructure was built to support them and in the life and livelihood of which they were accustomed well that infrastructure is now 110 115 years old um, and our tribal nations also are trying to build up our governments in the last 75 years on the leftovers residual infrastructure of um of facilities that were created by the government for government officers on the reservation 100 plus years ago um, well, when you're looking at having an economy um, in a community enterprise, like in my little baby district here um, on the reservation, the people really feel the need for a laundromat, for example. Um, you know, we're 35 miles in either direction from the laundromat, and often we go to those laundromats and all the people from our town are there also doing their laundry. Um, so... Um, when people are are looking at the infrastructure, whether you're whether you're aware of it or not, there are um, other elements that are at play that will affect your the speed at which you are able to get your business up and off the ground. You go from your passion into that. But I want to start with understanding the structure of the economy. So this is um, actually an image that was. It, that was derived from a conversation with tribal leader about you know 20 years ago um, or so when um, the community had a um, a small nonprofit that was emerging to provide some critical services to um, the children in the community by engaging them this was um, a time when um, there was latchkey kids but who's, who's sometimes you don't even have a latch you just got kid going home and they're there for whatever reason 
Um, and this community really wanted to um, do something organizing for the kids and they formed a nonprofit and they asked the tribe for a letter of support. And the tribal governance leaders, they weren't willing to write the letter of support. And we were talking about it later on and I asked the, you know, the, the leader, why, why, why don't you want to give them a letter of support? And he said, well, we have a youth program. Um, and if they're going to go out and start fundraising, um, we don't want those funds to be taken away from our youth program because we are also writing those grants. And so the conversation, the, the, the coin that dropped for me at that point was that our tribal leadership, when we, it's not just our tribal leadership, it's our community. We don't get the picture of what the, what an economy looks like as a vehicle. So we don't understand necessarily how we all fit into that picture. Um, and so, um, this picture was drawn on a restaurant napkin <laughs> as the first introduction to, let's take a look at what it actually looks like. And so um, if you look along that left hand, uh, that left hand uh, arm, you see the public sector. And the public sector in the United States is, you know, the federal government, state government, county governments, all of these public sector entities exist to provide us with the systems and services that let us, let us live collectively as a unit, power lines, water septic systems, the lagoons, um, roads, power, schools, hospitals, all of that. So the public sector um, is kind of the, the systems piece that lets us have, uh, have that stability in, our, in how we live together. And the private sector, of course, uh, down below, it concerns itself with the sale of goods and services. So the sale of goods and services, we all know that, um, you know, American capitalism, you know, is really uh, is really recognized as being a global force. And there's all kinds of things being sold through uh, the private 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 enterprise. Um, and in the United States, this is this is a new, econ new dimension of an economy that emerged in the United States, which is now being replicated all around the world, which is the nonprofit or the non not-for-profit um, third sector. Um, and it concerns itself with all of the things that fall outside of the government's capacity to take care of things like um, uh, children's programs, boys and girls clubs, animal shelters, um, all of those kinds of things. So when we understand that that is how the American economy is shaped, even when we are even when we are blowing billions and billions of dollars, it's still stable because it's a triangle. It's a triangulated community economy. And so when you look at tribal economies inside that little triangle, you would see we would make up a smaller triangle, right? And so this is the issue in our in our tribal governance structures is that our tribal public sector, which is our tribal government, also is expected um, to have the capacity to hold up the function of the mirror that goes out into the broader analysis. And so all of our senators and all those people in Washington, DC, they think that all of this stuff is in place in our communities when it's not. Um, so I will speak to, um, for example, in Crow country, the public sector, um, if you look at that long black line, I would say our, our tribal government, um, when coal was in its heyday, which we know it no longer is, that line, if we were to draw a line inside of that, might go up a third of the way, maybe half. Let's say it's half, half developed. Our public sector was funded not off of taxation, which is how the U.S. government's um, public sector is funded. Our government was funded off of the sale of non-renewable resources, coal, to about half, the tune of about half of what we actually needed across our districts. So if you imagine a little tiny line there, our private sector on the reservation, I would say maybe 10% of what we need. So if you take that big long line and you make a little one there, you see our private sector uh, might even be just a series of little dots that don't even meet each other. On the nonprofit sector, you have 
emerging entities that um, are doing things like uh, culture programs, leadership, um, food, you know, um, food security work, all of those things that are just, um, they're just not right at the center of our, of our tribal leadership's efforts to honestly to stop the hemorrhaging of our tribal government systems. And so this is the shape of the economy. And when you're trying to get a group of people to work together um, and to become, as Lakota was mentioning, become like civically involved, it's really important that they understand how important they are in their willingness to step into this kind of a model and to become um, a champion and a front runner in rebuilding this kind of an economic structure within our communities, because this is a new model. Um, you know, it's been growing for a couple hundred years in under the banner of the United States. And like I said, it's been, it's replicating around the world, but in our tribes, we've just been trying to not drown. Um, and so when you think about things like where we have had to innovate in our tribal economies, the innovations have occurred. So if you think of, um, for example, a casino, a casino is an enterprise that spans that, that corner, that lower left-hand corner of a tribal government created a private enterprise, which is a gaming enterprise, in order to generate revenue in a manner that the United States does not do. Well, we have to out of necessity of our environments. You have along that private sector line in the bottom right-hand corner, you have entities like the CDFIs that, that are create a nexus there between functioning like a nonprofit concerning itself with the people who come in the door and also bridging that place into accessing capital. Um, Lakota said going to a regular bank. What that means is a, a mainstream conventional enterprise doesn't concern itself necessarily with where the, where the human people are <laughs> who need to be supported in engaging in that enterprise. So CDFIs kind of span, uh, span that dimension. Um, when you look up at the very top entities that behave like public sector entities and nonprofit sectors would be like our tribal colleges. Our tribal colleges have a foothold in that. So in our tribal economies, what we have to do is to innovate the structures that make sense for us, our people, our governments, and where we are in our readiness to put some stakes down and start growing this baby. Once you understand how what the vehicle looks like, the economy is a vehicle that we can drive towards our restoring the well-being of our people, like, like was mentioned in the videos that we just watched. But if you don't understand what the vehicle looks like and you've been a passenger, you know, oftentimes riding around blindfolded, maybe sometimes in hogtied in the trunk, you don't have any sense of where it can go, what its potential is, um, or how you can use it to take you where you want to go. So we always like to begin at the beginning of understanding this is what an economy looks like in, in America and as nations, when we want to participate fully um, in accessing the resources and the capital and so forth that's out there, we need to understand how it looks and how it fits so that we can support each other's viability in bringing those pieces together. Now, if you can imagine, um, so I'm here in Wyola, we've got a little baby community. All we have is a post office and an elementary school. And yet this is the thing in our community, we're working on educating people so they can understand how all the pieces fit and it is remarkable about the, the accelerated readiness that we have between our tribal leadership, our community, potential entrepreneurs, um, and the people who often step into those supporting roles of doing the advocacy and the encouragement and so forth, absent uh, a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, en entity um, like Lakota leads. So, this is a piece of understanding what the vehicle of an economy looks like. And so back to the story, 
of the tribal leader, and this is again going into the place of if once you understand the economy, you understand how everybody fits, and you also understand how vast the opportunity is to create and forge. Um, and that means that we have to support and help each other because um, it's a supremely heavy lift to ask an individual who is passionate about uh, coffee, doing a coffee shop, uh, selling beadwork. It's a supremely uh, heavy lift to expect them to remedy the infrastructure needs on that block where you want to build a thing. You know, it, it just, it doesn't make it. What that does is that encountering obstacles of that size and depth and dimension has the effect of turning people's uh, enthusiasm down into going back into a place of despair. And it's not their fault. It's, <laughs> it's a decrepit system we inherited that we're trying to build new on and we got to have we got to have um we got to have assistance to do that i want to circle back around also when you're talking about um what how can tribal governments support a positive ecosystem for businesses and individuals to thrive um one is you got to have outfits like um uh like four bands in order to provide the human supports you got to be able to have access to the capital, but you got to have that support system. But what do tribes do? One is when tribes, even if, and this is this is a truth among all of our nations, and it's not a conviction of um, of desire or a, a, a will, a will. Even if our tribal financial management systems are in a state of disrepair uh, or are, are broken or seized up. There are funds out there that can only be accessed by tribes, tribal governments as the sovereign. So, you know, we're hearing about hundreds of millions, billions of dollars that are available in the U.S. economy and they're available to tribes. Everybody go get some. Our tribal governments are already, as I said, they're already struggling to um, stay stay afloat and to stop the hemorrhaging of a lot of systemic issues that have been become like a chronic, you know, a, a chronic illness inside the body of our of our governance systems. Even if those systems are seized up and the tribal government system is not able to leave the garage as a vehicle on its own through strategic partnerships the tribes could partner with other other entities within ser providing services within their communities in order to create the aperture for those funds to flow into the tribal economy it may not come through the tribal government coffers itself because that's seized up if it is um but being able to understand how do the people in the community benefit by the tribal government coming alongside the entities that do in a much smaller um in a much smaller scale it's kind of like the tribe is the greyhound bus and you know these other entities might be a little four-wheeler uh or might even be a four-wheel drive with a camper on it that can go some places to be able to have the willingness to leverage the presence and the authority to come down and bring those resources into the community, um, as was mentioned about um, in the slides, in the videos that we saw of building the policies that encourage those um, partnerships and create a, a, a fertile environment for small things to um, grow bigger is huge is really really huge um and so i wanted to to mention that because there are a lot of dollars um that are out there um however without um tribal government engagement and ally building within their own community economies um the vast majority of those dollars will only go to um to build up existing large market enterprises 
that frankly they already know how to drive those they already know how to get that right. money and do do the things that they do and so i wanted to mention that um you know the individual readiness the other thing is embracing small wins it's a personal journey to go from despair and the world around me doesn't you know it doesn't have what it doesn't isn't supporting my basic needs to seeing oneself as a business person to overcoming the emotional and you know demographic and geographic hurdles to become a business person but then there are also those things where we can celebrate the small wins and going from you know a, a coffee kiosk in one district to helping somebody else do another coffee kiosk in another two now we're ready to build an actual building um, and so on and so forth and being able to grow incrementally um, and expand the businesses as our entrepreneurship grows and expands and becomes more sophisticated. Um, and so I'll stop there um, because those are the main things that I, I wanted to touch on. Um, and I really think that the videos up front helped to kind of stack the, the stepping stones of context. Um, and so I'll I'll stop my my uh, comments there. Thank you so much, Leslie. Appreciate it. And I want I brought this uh, visual up because I think it speaks to what you shared earlier on in your remarks. Is that one of the challenges is that people in tribal communities can't see themselves in in their own economy now and what their economy should look like. And um, that was one of the reasons we created this infographic that appears in NCAI's. Uh, new building a tribal economies toolkit, which Suzanne has placed the PDF of in the chat. Uh, this is towards it's part of the introductory material, but it gets at, you know, the here are all of the key players you need uh, w active and working ideally in concert to recreate that. It's sort of it's sort of a circular version of what you just shared with your triangle diagram. And it, make no mistake, number one is tribal citizens. It's it's they have to be engaged. They have to be. Um, they have to be um, engaged to to think about, ponder, and understand, and be and be um, educated and trained to contribute in all the valued roles that the nation needs them to play in order to for the nation to thrive again. And so, um, just wanted to flag this. So we do have a question. Um, Tracy asks, "How are both of you providing resources for business development?" in light of demographics and the need for a healthy profit in a business to be sustainable in the long term. So, I, I mean, for us, we continue to offer something called, um, we call it Create, and it's a 12, um, six week business development course, and we offer it three times a year. And throughout that process, I guess, you know, you get various people who are on the spectrum of um, starting a business or thinking about a business all the way to like owning and wanting to grow a business. And so we sort of individualize it every time we get a new cohort and we offer different speakers. But we've, after 12 years, built up quite a few tools and, um, you know, like different a, a toolkit that we hand out to our entrepreneurs, depending on where they're at in that business cycle. And so usually what it looks like if if they're trying to make a profit, it is about helping them with their financials and showing them projections and cash flows. But I think we even go beyond that. And we offer oftentimes if we see a small business who's just busy running their small business and can't quite get to the paperwork side of things, we really understand that. It's happened throughout all of the years. We really encourage them to work with a bookkeeper. And we actually prepay for that for like a year's worth of service of accounting services. And they can select whoever they feel comfortable working with that, but that way they sort of have another mind that's looking at their books with them and talking. And it's not a tax accountant at the end of the year. That's a different type of accountant that's needed. But if they really want to look at profits and ensure that they're hitting their goals, they really do need that sort of one-on-one -on -one assistance. And oftentimes it's hard to put that in their budget. So we've tried to ease that by fundraising and asking funders to allow us to pass through grants and pay for that type of service for our small businesses that are in need of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'll uh, answer that. I'll, I'll answer that based on. Um, so in 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 my business, um, I'm on this panel because for the last 30 years in my business, which is uh, planning, strategic planning, consensus building, been working all over Indian country. Um, so I have a lot of context about what our people are going through. Um, 
and so in my business by myself, we don't do any kind of engagement business development. However, as a citizen of my community and as an organizer, I have been working with my own community here on the reservation for the past several years to try to create a fertile environment for us to build our own economy. And I think that one of the first things we had to do was get realistic about what are people actually uh, ready? What's the capacity of the people to to thrive? And as I mentioned, our community wants a laundromat. Our community wants a little diner. Um, who's going to run the water? Who's going to run? Well, first of all, we don't have the water systems that can can handle, you know, 10 loads of laundry being done at once. Our systems just can't do that. Um and we didn't have when we had the conversation about who's ready to step up and take the loan and become the business owner. People were not ready to do that. People were ready to be employees. So we backed the conversation all the way up to what is the what is the construct of enterprise for this community that the broadest cross section of people who live here can participate in, even if it's intermittent that are ready to participate in that. And we came up with a neighborhood track. Um, not a not a big honk and paramutual track or whatever, but our community by itself at one time had like seven Indian relay teams coming off of the lands of um, tribal people who are still living on their land, still running horses. Our community is tiny, but we had seven Indian relay teams or five or however many. That's significant. So the people who live out on the outer perimeter of our of our district in their lands, they know how to monetize an event like that, but we don't have the infrastructure for it. The people who live in the town, they know how to run vendor booths, food booths, all of those things around the perimeter of a track. And so that infrastructure by itself represents the most logical starting point for our district to uh, to begin an economic, create an economic engine that activates the resourcing of the most number of households and and people across our community. And once people, um, you know, have a little uh, frog skins coming into their life, right? The feeling of despair starts to go and the, the standard of living goes up. And then people are hopeful and ready to look at what's next, formalize it. How can I do that? Et cetera, et cetera. So the way we approached that was to um, abandon an image of coming out of a, a small business, you know, a rural small business, whatever of, you know, Wyoming or something like that. Um, we really took a step back and said, what are the people in our community ready for? And what are the systems we can put into place that we can handle? We can handle building. Uh, that can foster the active engagement of the broadest number of people. And I feel like once we get those seeds planted, um, as as uh, Lakota was mentioning about, you know, people have money to buy their booth stuff and whatnot. I just think that is really going to take off. And those are kind of the organizing ways that we've decided on what's most appropriate and it's about the readiness of our community members uh, to do that, to do whatever kind of enterprises that they want to do. Thank you, Leslie. And um, we have a follow-up question that I think is a good segue from what Le Leslie was just sharing about readiness. And Lakota, I know you deal with a lot of, a lot of um, would-be entrepreneurs that come through your doors and they have these grand ideas and these grand thoughts about, about what their businesses are going to uh, look like, how, how, successful they're going to be right out of the gate. And uh, I, I think you do some reality checking with them, right? And and the question's focused on how do you get your, how do you get the entrepreneurs you work with to, to um, be realistic about profitability, to prioritize profitability, be realistic about it, and then prepare them to be calculated in how they generate profitability to make sure that their businesses are sustainable over the long run and can grow? Uh, honestly, I mean, that, that's exactly what you do in that order. Uh, he just described how you had the conversation. But I think what we want to be sure when we talk into a small business over, and this is what I mean of building a relationship, usually when people take our class, 
they don't graduate and are like right away, like, bam, six weeks, I'm ready to start a business. Honestly, each of the classes brings up every one of those questions. And what we do is guide them to that decision because there's nothing worse than standing in front of a, a hopeful group of people and telling them that their idea is not going to work. <laughs> Instead, it's like show, having them come up with their own answer. And one thing we want to start tracking is actually how many of the people walk away from our classroom and decide that starting a business is not right for them based off of that sort of logic of getting them to that point. And so really every time, it's not just the arc of the story that we get of like, this is how great the idea is going to be. We always force entrepreneurs who are generally hopeful people and optimistic to say, and now tell me about what if it doesn't work and, and getting them into that conversation. So it's also making sure they have an exit strategy and a support system around them. Do you have an extra way to get income? Can you Do you have skills that you could get a job just in case this doesn't work, right? And, and you don't leave your family hanging with debt. So it's adding that end part of the conversation and the end part of the story because the, the statistics are pretty all over America, right? Of five businesses started like to survive after the first five years. Like that's just, a, it's risky. So making that clear to them and ensuring they understand their story arc and that they have an end to their story just in case, I think is part of the education and programming that we do. But most of our, a lot of our participants walk away making the decision for themselves if it's profitable because of the the teaching that we're doing in the classroom. So. Yeah, thank, thank um, you for that. I, yeah, go ahead, Leslie. I, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, the entry point for conversation um if making money there's usually we see our community members like with food booths and stuff like that they have a bill they're trying to pay they're actually many of them have a mortgage in billings that they come to do stuff to hurry up and however i liked the 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 reference of the story arc we have had such historical experiences with the taking of resources in the name of the almighty prophet that our people have a, a have a knee jerk a negative knee jerk reaction to making money because so many bad deeds have been done to our communities our tribes our nations for hundreds of years um in the name of making a profit for somebody else and so talking getting the need met Getting the financial need met is usually the entry point and then getting people adapted and acclimated to the language of business like profit takes a minute uh, because we have all of these other kinds of social, emotional, historical blah, in here that have, we've been conditioned to believe this is not for us. This is not our vehicle. Uh, just sit down. We'll take care of everything. And when I have the store ready, you can come in and buy what you need. Our people react to that. And so it, part of it is just finessing the conversations of where are they? What is really their motivator of getting their financial needs met? And how do you parlay that if they have the, the tenacity and the courage to stick with it and become the business person um, and supporting those that do and respecting those who go, well, you know, I had no idea that was not, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I really think it's always important um, in the financial, in any kind of financial conversation to have the respect for the integrity of our people and to not dismiss them because they had a terrible credit rating or whatever. Um, and so I just wanted to put those things into um, conscientiousness about language use and people's readiness to engage in those conversations, you got to start where people are at. Yeah, that's a great final point to leave folks with is that, you know, and, and I think again, back to back to what four bands does and what CDFIs do uh, and, and these native other native nonprofit organizations you mentioned, Leslie, is um, they're embedded in community. They're in, they intimately understand community and they're committed to, to meeting those, those people, whether they're, you know, prospective home buyers, prospective small business owners, where they're at. Um, well, we really appreciate the time that you've you've taken uh, to share with us today. Uh, thank you for to our attendees for for joining us. Um, in the chat, we've once again posted the links to the three videos. We encourage you to watch them. We encourage uh, you to share them with others. Uh, and and I did want to mention that NCI is working to finalize two companion guides, um, one for tribal nations, uh, tribal leaders, key decision makers, 
and then one for tribal colleges and universities to actually apply these videos in real life settings uh, to inform tribal decision making, to you know educate that that next generation of tribal leaders who are currently you know in tribal colleges and universities um, about the importance of native small business development and how to grow them. And also in the chat, we've we've posted a few other um, related resources um, that uh, we feel are really valuable. Um, for example, NCI did a webinar sharing um, about the importance of, of entrepreneurship uh, during the early days of COVID. Um, that uh, is is a really great watch. And then also um, a video uh, uh, of Robert Miller, who's a leading scholar on this subject, has written extensively on the topic. Uh, talking about how entrepreneurship was the bedrock of traditional Native economies, um, despite what some may think. And so I encourage you to um, grab those links real quick uh, before we wrap up. And um, thank you. Thank you for uh, to Suzanne for helping uh, and and, and uh, Musa with NCI uh, for helping uh, pull this uh, webinar series off. Uh, as attendees, we'll, we have your email. So we'll be following up with you and letting you know when the videos of these webinars will be made available on NCI's YouTube channel. And with that, we bid you a good afternoon.